Okay, everyone. In this presentation, I'm going to be introducing you to metallurgy for welders. Now, there's going to be a lot that I'm going to talk about in this presentation, but I'm even though I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about all these different things, I'm just going to give you the basics, and there's going to be two additional videos that you'll watch later on that go into a little more detail about some of the topics that we cover. So just at a glance, these are some of the things that I'm going to be talking about right now. The elements of steel. So what is steel made of? I'm going to be talking about grain structures. So how does steel look like when you open it up? And then the types of steel, because there are different types of steel. And then transitional temperatures. So what happens to steel as it heats up? And then what happens to steel as we cool it down? So elements of steel. What exactly is steel made out of? There's a lot of different elements that come together to create the steel that we work with in everyday industry jobs. But in its most basic form, steel is comprised of two elements, iron and carbon. There's going to be a lot of iron and there's just going to be a tiny bit of carbon. A little bit goes a long way and that's something that I'll talk about later on. Now there are also other elements that can be added to the mixture. This can be done on purpose. Things can be added in order to change the physical characteristics, some of the mechanical properties. And there are some things that are present in steel that are just a result of uh, the, the steel manufacturing process. But if you are curious, here is a list of the different alloying elements that can be added to steel. And in addition to that, you'll also see some of the things that they affect when they're added to steel. So just a couple of examples. We can take carbon. As we add carbon, it's going to affect the hardness, the strength, and the wear on steel. And let's see, let's, uh, if we add something like tungsten to steel, it's going to affect its strength at high temperatures and also wear and tear. So you can go ahead, pause here, look through the list, but all of these alloying elements are important for you to memorize right now. This is just to give you kind of an idea that there is more than just iron and carbon in steel. And so for now, we're just going to focus on those two. Okay, so let's get into the grain structure. What is a grain structure? If we were to rip a piece of steel apart or pull it until it breaks into pieces, and then we look inside those breaks underneath a microscope, what we're going to be looking at is the grain structure, or basically how the molecules of these elements bond to each other and layer up or um, essentially fold on top of one another in order to form these boundaries. So a good, a good example of a grain structure, you can think about the fabric that your clothes are made out of. Think of each an individual um, string of cotton. That is a grain structure for your clothing. Uh, think of sliced bread. When you pull a slice of bread out from a loaf and you can look inside and you see all the different strands and fibers of bread and you see all the different openings within the bread piece, that is the grain structure. So just about everything has a grain structure it just looks a little bit different. Some of them are more obvious. Some of them are a little bit harder to see. And so here's just a picture of various grain structures for steel. So there should be two that are completely opposite of each other. We'll start up at the top. So this is a piece of steel that has been more or less broken into two pieces and we're shown just one of them. So we can look inside and the grain structure from the naked eye looks pretty coarse. It looks pretty rough. Okay, this is what we call a coarse grain structure. And now at the very bottom, this would be a piece of steel that we would have received straight from the manufacturer. So this is a brand new piece of steel that's never been worked on. So you can take a look at the, at the surface and it looks a little bit smoother. It, uh, the grain structure is a lot more fine. So this is a fine grain structure versus a piece of metal that's probably been worked on, welded on a bunch of different times. And then it undergo a process called normalization in order to take that grain structure from being very coarse to 
going back to its original state of fine structure. This is something that's ideal. This is what we want whenever we're welding or, or working on something out in industry. So a little bit more about grain structures. So the various types of grain structures that we'll see when dealing with carbon steel actually have a name. So there are a few different types of grain structures. The first one is ferrite, then there's martensite, and there's perlite. So let's start with the first one, ferrite. Ferrite is a fine grain structure where there is much more iron than there is carbon. So there's a little bit of carbon in there, but not a whole lot. This is what we would see in a fine grain structure. Then there's martensite, which you can see right here. And I know it's a little tough to see, but this is an image that was taken when a piece of steel was looked at under a microscope. Martensite is when there is a lot more carbon trapped in between the bob of iron. So if you were to look a little bit closer under this microscope, the grain structure would look kind of like broken shards of glass. So it's not very fine. It would actually be very coarse. And then perlite is just a mixture of two different grain structures, ferrite and cementite. So if we remember ferrite is more of your fine grain structure, a lot less of a carbon, uh, carbon presence. Cementite is opposite of ferrite. Cementite is where there's actually a high presence of carbon, but perlite is different from martensite in that the cementite and ferrite are actually forming layers on top of each other. And that's why it's a little bit different than martensite. And I know this is a lot, so we can just kind of uh, say, remember ferrite as being ideal, fine grain structure, where there's a balance between iron and carbon. Whereas martensite is the opposite of being ideal. This is something that we want to try to avoid. This is where there, the balance is off. There is more carbon in between the bonds of iron and it's gonna make it a lot more brittle. It's gonna do a lot of things that we don't want to happen to steel. And I'll get into a little bit more about that here shortly. Okay, so when we're talking about the amount of carbon that's in the steel we're working with, we have to know that there are essentially three types of carbon steel. They're low carbon, medium carbon, and high carbon. So let's start with low carbon steel. If you were to take a piece of low carbon steel, it would only have about 0.05 to 0.3% carbon. The rest of it would be iron and then trace amounts of the other alloying elements. Now, when we start talking about temperatures, low carbon steel has a high transformation temperature. This occurs around 1,670 degrees Fahrenheit. I'll talk more about this later. You might see low carbon steel used in things like fasteners, like bolts, nuts, nails, uh, even fencing, pipelines, cookware, certain machine parts, and so forth. This is something that you probably encounter in everyday life. Then we have medium carbon steel. So if you were to take something that is made up of medium carbon steel, it would typically have anywhere from 0.3% to 0.6% carbon. Uh, this type of steel has a transformation temperature that's in the medial range. And you'll normally find medium carbon steel used in thing like uh, making the railway tracks uh, that trains run on, uh, making drive shafts, uh, gears, things of that nature. And now we have high carbon steel. Now, if you were to take a piece of high carbon steel, it would only have roughly 0.6% to 1% carbon. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot, but again, it's much higher than medium carbon and higher than low carbon steel. High carbon steel typically has a transformation temperature that's a lot lower than the other, than the previous two. 
So the transformation temperature for high carbon steel is roughly around 1,333 degrees Fahrenheit. And you'll typically find carbon steel used in things like swords, axes, knives, uh, spring steels, uh, tools, uh, things like wrenches, sockets, um, things like that. So let's kind of circle back to grain structures. Grain structures is roughly the shape or the pattern that these molecules are taking on as they form steel. So iron, carbon, and all the other alloying elements. Now when iron and carbon start forming with each other, they create sort of these cube looking features. They're called cubic microstructures. And so there's one of two forms that you'll typically find them in. One being body centered cubic and the other being face centered cubic and they occur at different temperatures. So the first one right here is what we're going to call body centered cubic. And then this one over to the right is face centered cubic. And if you have no idea what that means, don't worry, I'm about to get into it. So body centered cubic. Remember, this is the, uh, the shape of a cube. This is a microstructure that iron molecules are taking on. And so if you think of this cube, in each corner of the cube, there's going to be an iron molecule. And there's also going to be one in the center. So all together, there's going to be nine iron molecules. Now you don't see it in this picture, but typically there's going to be carbon molecules that are floating around in here. You know, maybe one or two, possibly three. But let's think lower numbers. So let's say at least one carbon molecule. Now this isn't really going to be important. The idea that I'm trying to get across to you is that there's going to be a very low presence of carbon when the microstructures are body centered cubic. So easy way to remember body centered cubic is that it occurs at room temperature. Now, when you start heating steel up, once you get steel to its transitional temperature, that microstructure is going to start to open up and expand. So now instead of having one iron molecule at each corner, we're now adding even more iron molecules to this because the iron is expanding within the, the grain structures. So we still have one in each corner, but now we have an additional iron molecule at the center of each side. Now with the expansion of this microstructure, we're also allowing more room for carbon molecules to kind of come in and find their way in between these iron molecules. So remember, face centered cubic is when the steel heats up to its transitional temperature and it allows for more carbon to enter these grain structures. There's this chart that you're probably going to see if you if you continue on and you take uh, a metallurgy class, but the transitional temperature for each type of steel is dependent on its carbon content. So remember we were talking about low carbon, medium carbon, and high carbon steel. So depending on the percentage of carbon that the steel has, that's going to be a factor in determining its transitional temperature. And the chart that you can use to find out this information is called the iron equilibrium chart or the iron equilibrium diagram. It goes by a few different names, but it's always the same thing. It's this really in-depth chart and so on the very left, I know it's a little hard to see, but it gives you examples of the grain structures. Also, it gives you a range of temperatures. And then within those ranges, you can see what's going on with the steel. And then down here at the bottom, you have percentages of carbon content. So all the way over here, you would have low carbon steel, medium carbon steel, high carbon steel. And so as the temperature increases, you can kind of see what's going on with the grain structure of steel. But we're not going to be covering this really in the chart. This is something that will come in a more advanced course. For now, let's take a look at something that is 
way easier to understand. So again, on the left, we have a range in temperatures. And then down here at the bottom, we have percent of carbon content. So we have, again, our low carbon steels over here, our medium carbon steels, and then our high carbon steels. So I remember very early on, I said that low carbon steel has a higher transitional temperature. So if we start at say 0.1% and we go up, we keep following this chart up here. And you'll see that the transitional temperature begins at around 1333 degrees. But for low carbon steel, we would keep going up the chart to about 1670. And if we were to come over to high carbon steel, it would transform at about 1333 degrees. And so what are some examples of, of this in, in real life? If you've ever seen the show called Forged in Fire, uh, they deal a lot with low carbon, medium carbon, and high carbon steels. Now, some of you may have not seen the show, and that's perfectly fine. The whole concept of this show is to take bits and pieces of scrap metal and turn them into functioning uh, weapons, whether it's a knife, a sword, an axe, or any number of different things. And these blacksmiths have to learn how to identify what type of steel that they're working with and then heat them up and cool them down appropriately according to their carbon content. And so you'll, if, you, if you've watched the show, you know how crucial it is to know your carbon content because a little bit of carbon can make a difference. Oh, and the other thing is, um, depending on the carbon content, you're also going to do something different with it as far as heat treating goes. And so why do we talk about heat treating? Because as we heat treat steel, we're changing it, the properties of it. We're changing the physical and mechanical properties. So the four things that you should be thinking about are hardness, brittleness, ductility, and strength. These four things are going to change depending how we heat the metal up how fast we heat it up, how long it stays heated, and how fast or how slow it cools on, in addition to how much carbon is in the steel. So the properties of steel is going to be another presentation that's coming up soon, and I'm also going to have a presentation on heat treatment, so stay tuned.